Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Cliff Laverne. This is Aaron Jeanette, and we're here uh, part of the Michael Laverne Memorial Foundation doing our workshop on digital camera equipment and uh, taking good photos and photo techniques. I'm going to handle the equipment standpoint, and then Aaron will pick up in about a half an hour, and she'll talk about uh, techniques, depth of field, uh, shutter speeds, and some of the, the, the key issues the key things to know and understand when using any camera, but specifically digital cameras. We'll talk about that. So um, I'm going to get started here. This is geared towards people that uh, are looking to, to buy uh, a, a new camera. Um, I got in my hand here a workhorse that I had over the years. This is a Nikon FM2. This is a 35 millimeter film camera. But the, the, the techniques, if you know how to use one of these, the techniques of a digital camera are, are really the same. There's a couple of extra little niceties that are specific to, to the digital world. But for the most part, the, the techniques, everything is pretty much the same. So um, if you're looking to buy a camera at this point, um, things to understand are the film camera is still excellent quality and only a few digital cameras rival the quality of them. However, um, it's getting more and more difficult to find places that will develop film, to buy film, to get the type of films you want. There are so many different speeds uh, on film. It's just it's more expensive. Uh, and if you don't have the, uh, if places don't have the demand, then they're not going to, uh, they're not going to continue to support film. So it almost forces you into the digital realm. So considering a, a, a digital camera, there are, are definitely benefits to it. You don't have to buy any film, uh, but you do need a storage device. And the storage devices are an SD card. Do you have to have one out handy? So I want to take it out of there. Okay. This, is, uh, this is what an SD card looks like. This is a 16 gigabyte from SanDisk Extreme. So this one is a, uh, a class 10, which means it's, um, it's the highest in the classes and it's a 45 megabytes per second, which means you can take lots of pictures in rapid succession and the card can keep up with the camera. There and are video. cards and video. Uh, cards, there are, I guess I should talk about it now, there are class four and smaller classes that in some cases will not keep up with the camera, so you want to avoid those. We can um, entertain questions about that uh, if they come up. Then you also need long-term storage because that only has 16 megabytes and uh, 16 gigabytes on it. When that's full, you either have to delete off of it or you need to move the stuff off of it onto another type of a storage device. And you can use your PC, you can use a network drive, or you can use cloud storage. Are we doing cloud storage again? Not today. We are not. Okay. So, but uh, is that that wasn't filmed, so it won't be on our uh, on our website. Correct. Okay. Um, and then you can you can save because you only have to print the pictures you like. And the pictures that are good, you keep. Uh, the pictures that are really good and you want to print, you print them. And the pictures you don't like, well, you can just delete them, throw them away, and they are forever gone. And for printers, there are there still are a lot of places to do printing. Um, any of the drugstores, CVS, uh, Walgreens, and Walmart, of course, does it. Target probably does it too. So uh, they're they're easy to find. And if one machine's broken, you just go down to the next store. And it's relatively cheap. All right, so types of digital cameras. They range from small print and shoot, uh, point shoots. This is a, a work art, kind of work art for us. This is a, um, a Canon, uh, Canon PowerShot SX210IS. We've had this for about three years, and uh, we take a lot of uh, a lot of pictures. My wife keeps it in her purse. It's easy and quick, and uh, automatic focus. You simply point it, and you take a picture, and there it is, nice, perfect in every way. Instant gratification on the back. You can see what the picture looks like. You don't like it, you can delete it on the spot, or you can um, save it and move on to the next picture. Point and shoots have a lot of um, have advantages. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'll get back to the thing here. Then there's your DSLR. Okay, this is a digital single lens reflex. As you can see, it looks a lot like the film uh, single lens reflex. They only they took the same term of an SLR and stuck a D in front of it for digital. So now you have a digital SLR. 
and these are uh, uh, some advantages over that. I'll get into that uh, in, in a moment. These DSLRs come in what's called a compact DSLR. Uh, this is a comp uh, this is a compact DSLR, and then you have. Um, I, I would think that uh, what do you have there? It's a the, Canon. The 60D. The 60D would be what's called a medium, and then they have um, some super highly professional models. I don't know if that's that's that would be. Well, this is a DSLR. That's a compact as well. Yeah. Uh, that's comparable to the Nikon. And then this, this one is the here, 60. The 60. Full frame. That's full frame, but there's also a full frame professional with 11 frames per second. Really craziness to it. And those are the large ones. I believe that's going to be, be called a medium. And then I've got a picture of a, of a Nikon D4, which is uh, you'll see it <laughs> as we come along. This particular camera, I've got um, a mount on the bottom of it, which allows me to put this onto uh, to the tripod. We'll talk about tripods a little bit later. But I can just put that into place, and now I'm mounted on the tripod. Set that aside for now. Oh yes, and then there's one more type of camera, and that's your how's, how about my cell phone camera? Everybody has a uh, every camera, even flip phones like this old flip phone that I carry around has a cell phone camera in it. Uh, and then you got your smartphones. The quality of that's going to be a little bit better, but in general, the quality of your smartphone camera as well. They're fine for taking pictures and posting on Instagram, um, and you may be capturing an automobile accident or something important, and it happens to be the camera you have with it. But if you want to take high quality pictures, no matter what Samsung or uh, LG says, they're not going to cut it. They're not even as good as the pictures you're going to take with, uh, with a point and shoot. So let's talk about the point and shoot. So the advantages of a point and shoot, as you can see, very small, very compact, very light, just get in your back pocket. Some, they're similar in the, in the pig, megapixel size. I think this one is, what is this one? I don't know what this one is, but I think it's around 10 megapixels. Okay, but the, the, the megapixels in this one, the pixels in a point and shoot, the pixels in a, in a DSLR, uh, they're not the same type of pixels. So you always have to, you can't just say megapixels alone is not gonna say that this camera is better than that particular camera. So that's a key point. Okay, uh, if the uh, point and shoot camera has a range finder, if it has a, a viewfinder, something that you actually look through, this one does not. Okay, this one projects the image onto the LCD monitor in the back. So what's coming through the lens is what you're showing on here. There are other point and sh uh, shoot cameras like um, like this DSL, uh, like this old SLR that has a viewfinder here. And um, but they'll never look through the lens like this one is. They just have uh, another piece of glass over here, so you can get an idea of what you're shooting. But it's not exactly what you're shooting. The only way you know exactly what you're shooting is if what you're looking through goes through the main lens. Okay, some um, some point and shoot cameras are, are waterproof. This one is not. If you drop it in the water, you are done. You can throw it away. Um, The point and shoots, um, because they are smaller, also have a smaller sensor size. We'll talk about sensors. I've got a slide coming up that show you in comparison, um, compares all the point and shoots all the way up through the full frame cameras and beyond, and how they compare with the 35 millimeter form, fat, form factor of a standard SLR, film SLR, and the full frame cameras that mimic that. Um, your point and shoots will always have, uh, will always come with a lens, and it's a fixed lens. There's no way that you can take it off and replace it. So the lens that you have is the lens that you have for the life of the camera. Um, okay, fixed lenses. Yeah, so talk about that. Also, this particular camera has a, a digital zoom on it, which allows you to um, change from a wide angle up to a telephoto. And you'll see the lens start to grow as I push on the uh, on the zoom lens, and I can retract the zoom. So I'm going to wide angle, and now I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, telephoto. There comes a point where the telephoto reaches its maximum, but it'll actually go a little bit further. So where it where it reaches its maximum is called the the limit of the optical zoom. 
Okay, you're literally changing the optics. You're moving the lens farther and away and closer to the sensor. They also may have what they call a digital zoom. And a digital zoom is not really a zoom at all. It's, it's, it's comparable to going on your computer and zooming in on an image that you've already taken. It actually manipulates the pixels to make them larger. It's not going to give you any, any increased definition in your, uh, in your picture. So you really want to stay away from um, digital zoom and save, uh, and save that for your post-processing on your computer. Every, every picture that you take with a point and shoot is, gonna, shoot is probably going to be what's called the JPEG, Joint Photographic Experts Group. It's a compressed format, and, and that is really the only thing that you get from it. As you step up in your cameras, you can uh, get what's called a raw image, and that's not an acronym. That just means it's, it's raw, just like meat is raw. It's, it's uncooked. Well, this, the picture has, uh, has not been manipulated in any particular way, and that's called a raw image. And last of all, they can, you can take some really good pictures with these. So um, don't scoff at it, simply because it's, it's a simple point and shoot. So uh, let's talk about digital single lens reflex cameras now. They come in various sizes, uh, as I mentioned about that before. Um, this, one is, this one here is a compact. As it, this, is the, um, this is a Nikon D5100. Uh, it's, this one's being phased out, it's been replaced by the D5200, which is what I use in the comparison charts to see a little bit later uh, when I get a slide on that. You have your, your medium size, which is uh, this one here. That's the... I'm sorry, this, this, is, uh, this is Canon's equivalent, pretty much exactly the same size as, um, as the Nikon version of it. This one also is a, uh, would be considered a compact DSLR. And then this one here is a medium format. It might be a, might be a, a large format. I'm really not that familiar with the Canon size. Uh, every time you, you step up, you step up to a, a larger sensor size, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And this one is a Canon EOS 6D. So, take this off. So much more familiar with this one. Okay, um, DSLR cameras come in a large price range. They can range from, uh, this one was about $500. They'll range from anywhere from $500 up to $7,000 or more if you want a professional grade camera. They have uh, larger sensors. Uh, this particular um, compact DSLR has what they call an APS-C, Advanced Photographic, Photographic System Type C. It's larger, much larger than the sensor in this particular camera, but not as large as the full frame sensor that is in the, um, this EOS 16. When they say a full frame, that means it's exactly the same size as a 35 millimeter camera. You can see that, I'll open this guy up. And you'll, you'll see the shutter inside there. So this is, this is 35 millimeters across. It's actually 36, I believe, but, uh, but it's called the 35 millimeter. And that's exactly the same size as the sense that you'll find in the um, EOS 60 and uh, the Nikon D800. We'll take a look at that a little bit later. All right, so they have uh, larger sensors. They have removable lenses. That's a big deal. You, the lens you're, you're with on here is the lens you're stuck with. If you break it, it's done. Um, Here's a one that's not attached one, to the one that's camera. Off, I just want to show how easy it is to change it too. So if you want to change the, uh, the lens, you push a button, you turn it slightly, off it comes, you can put a new one on. <laughs> It's going to line up the white dots. That's there we go. Do it. If I wanted to, by the way, Nikon kept this, the same format. I can take the lens off of this film camera and put that on here if I'd like, if I want to. Does it go the other direction? So you could take the digital lens and put it on the film camera? No, no. I would, I, well, it would fit, but it wouldn't work. And it, and it, it also wouldn't work for a different reason. Um, that's a, and that's a good point. I'm going to talk about lenses later, but really, as a quick introduction, in case I forget later on, um, this one has a smaller sensor than this one. 
Actually, let me use the uh, the cannons. These are interchangeable, are they not? The lenses? Most of the time. They're, they'll fit, but they won't. But you, you can take the lens off of this 6D and you can put it on that camera, and that'll work great. Yep. But if you have a lens that is designed for the 60D and you put it on the 6D, I believe it'll fit, but you, the picture will look really funky because that lens is sized to the smaller APS-C format. This has a full frame sensor in it, it's a big sensor. So the lens has to be set up so that it projects its image onto the whole full sensor. If it did it in that particular camera, you would actually lose the picture. You take the picture and you wonder why it's so much smaller than what you thought you were, you were getting. Did I do that right? Sometimes it gets sort of like tunnel vision yeah. if the lens was designed for the ASP, AS, P, ATS, S, yeah. yeah. So you get a little tunnel vision. So if you're thinking of upgrading when you're buying lenses, buy the lenses for the full frame because they will always work with the cropped frame. But not the other way around, and that's important. So if you have invested in lens for your APS-C style format, then you go out and get your full frame, you're in for a big disappointment that you're not going to really be able to use those lenses. So as, as Aaron said, buy the best lenses you can because they're, they're so much... Uh, the optics are the big deal in cameras, you know, the, uh, and that's what makes the price. Okay, so uh, what I talked about was the lenses. Um, you can put uh, filters on. Uh, this, this camera has a UV filter on it, which really does very, very little uh, in terms of changing your picture quality. But it does, the big deal is it protects your lens. Lenses cost $200 plus dollars. This little um, little filter costs $12. So if it gets scratched, you take it, you screw it off, you throw it away. Um, if it gets broken, as long as it doesn't break through and scratch the lens underneath it, you still take it off and throw it away. And then there are other, uh, other filters. We can talk about them. There's polarizing filters, which help reduce glare. You can do special effects with um, kaleidoscopes, and you can do special effects with various different colors, especially if you shoot in black. Uh, well, I guess you could shoot in black and white. Take any color picture and convert it to, to monochrome. And um, in, in every case, you see what the sensor sees. You're doing, it's called through the lens viewing. Okay, what gets, what you see in your viewfinder or what gets projected onto the back is uh, exactly what you're seeing in the lens, which is really important when you're zooming. And then um, they'll have an external flash. As you can see, there's no way you can put an external flash on this one. This is called a, a hot shoe, and this one has, uh, has it, the film camera has it up on the top. I can imagine these do yep. too. And this this guy doesn't even come with a built-in flash. Some of the higher-end cameras, because the expectation is you would have an external flash. Sure, sure. So this one has a flash, but the nicer camera doesn't. If you're going to invest in a nicer camera, then uh, you have to invest in flash. That's the uh, you know, the rationale behind that one. Okay, so it's all about the sensor. This is a very busy slide, apologize for that. I tried to remove some of the formats I didn't want to talk about, like Fovian and Four Thirds. Um, but you can see, obviously this is a lot bigger than 35 millimeters, but this blue line that goes over here is what's known as full frame. And that is 35 millimeters across. It is the exact same format and it supposedly takes the goodest quality picture as a film camera with uh, 35 millimeters. So that is the standard. There are actually uh, some that are larger than that. Um, Kodak makes one that's uh, framed, uh, one that's larger than that. I don't really know what that's for. Do you know anything about that? No. Okay. So, but you can Wikipedia, you know, <laughs> if you want, and, uh, and find out what that is all about. Um, going down from uh, full frame in size, you have what Canon call uh, unique to Canon is APS-H. I'm going to assume that's uh, Advanced Photographic System Type H. Then you have uh, Nikon's APS-C, okay, which is in this kind of, uh, I don't know what color that is, it's kind of a yellowish brown color. Um, following down from that, we have APS-C Canon, which is a little bit smaller than APS-C's uh, Nikon. And then beyond that, you get these other formats, Bovian, Four Thirds. Then they, um, when they got down to the small ones, they're shown as a fraction. 1 over 1.6, 1 over 1.7, and 1 over 2.5. So as the numbers go up in the denominator, the, the sensor size gets smaller and smaller. 
this particular uh, Canon, the SX210IS that I have here, is called a 1 over 2.3, which puts it someplace in between this 1 over 2.5 and this 1 over 1 over 1.8. So you can see, let's just, we'll just use the 1 over 2.5. So you're comparing this green to the um, to the yellow brown color there, you can see that this is gosh gotta be ten times smaller. So that means that the resolution of the pictures is going to be ten times smaller too. And it really only comes into frame when you want to blow the pictures up. If you want to blow a picture up taking this to poster size, you're gonna be disappointed. It'll be very grainy, you'll be able to make out what it is, but really not designed for that. This is really designed for, you know, uh, four by four by six pictures that you would normally put into a photo album. But they will, they, they will look fine uh, on a desktop screen um, for a laptop or, uh, or even a, a, a 21 inch or 24 inch screen. It'll still, the quality will still be fine. It'll start to lapse. Um, it'll probably start to lapse if you're using this frame, I don't know, about 60 inch, a 60 inch or maybe even a 70 inch screen. And then you're, you're going to know, you'll definitely be able to see a difference between the quality of the picture taken with one of these and taken with the DSL. Any questions about full frame and uh, any of the types of sensors? No? You can find this uh, slide in Wikipedia if you search on APS-C. It'll come up. All right, so here's some examples of cameras. This one, these guys will look familiar. Right, this is the Canon PowerShot SX210. This is the Nikon D5200 looks just like the 5100. has a few advanced features. It's a Nikon D800. Is a um, is a full frame, and then the uh, the Nikon D4s is a full frame with all sorts of uh, extra enhancements to it. Uh, if you're thinking about buying a Nikon D4s, well, you're not probably not going to want to look at this presentation right now because it's pretty basic, and and that's a seven thousand dollar plus camera. <laughs> So here's a camera comparison. These are the same uh, charts. I know this is a bit of an eye chart. Just some of the things I want to talk about. Uh, the key differences between the cameras. Uh, the number of, first of all, let's start off with the sensor. Uh, the sensor size. As I mentioned, the, the power shot to 1 over 2.3, which is only 6 millimeters across. The APS-C is 23.5 millimeters across. Full frame is 35 or 36 millimeters across. And uh, both the, the D800 and D4S uh, have the full frame sensor. We talked about formats of taking a picture. The um, point and shoot does not allow you to compress format. Uh, the, the Nikon, all the Nikons and the uh, the Canons also um, they'll give you a raw, and, or they'll also get, you don't have to shoot in raw. You can shoot in JPEG, or and in the case of the, the Nikon D4S, it also gives you TIFF, which is another uh, file format. A lot of them will allow you to shoot both at the same time. If you want the RAW just to have, but you want those JPEGs right away, it'll shoot two pictures at a time and you'll get both of those. Okay, because that slows you down your ability to, uh, to it's shoot? It's so fast. It'll still shoot. At yeah, you can even do that in burst mode. It'll awesome. It'll really fast. Good stuff. Um, we can talk about, I'm not going to talk too much about the processors because I've never heard of the Digic and the XP. And, uh, but um, as you go up in price, obviously the processors uh, the processors get better, but uh, the processors really don't make the price too much though because the semiconductors are cheap. It's the optics and the size of the sensors that really drive the cost of the camera. We talk about megapixels, all right? There's, uh, there's something called uh, sens the sensor photo detector pixels and then there's the effective pixel pixels. The total pixel megapixels, it says it's a 15 megapixel camera, Okay, that is the number of pixels that are on the sensor itself. Okay, not all of those are usable. The ones that are on the edge tend to distort. And uh, remember, you're, you're taking a, um, uh, a circular lens and protecting it onto a flat screen. So uh, some of the pixels are a loss. So that what you really want to take a look at is, is the effect of pixels. And those are the ones that actually show up in the picture when you take it. Okay, and they range, these range from 14 megapixels up to 36 megapixels. Um, you'll notice that the most expensive camera, the D4S, only has 16 megapixels, yet the, the less expensive D800 has 36 megapixels, or what you would expect. 
And as the megapixels go up, the price should go up. And that's not necessarily uh, that's not necessarily true. So the way the pixels are different. Something that if I knew fuller, I would try to explain a little bit further, fuller, but I wasn't able to get enough information on that. Um, you know anything more about those? No, it's once you get in the DSLR range, it's not really the feature you should be paying attention to. So I, I have also haven't done the thing. I, the thing I want to key on is the size of the sensor. So if you can afford it, you probably want to go with one of these mid-range uh, D800, D6, or um, or, or APS, APS-C, which are still quite quite uh, high quality. But I would recommend to anybody over over getting the full frame start. You can get really good photos with any crop frame DSLR. That it doesn't make sense to move up until you're really comfortable with the crop frame. Right. If you're just starting out, absolutely um, get yourself uh, an entry level DSLR like uh, the the, the Canon 60 yeah, yeah. or the or the Nikon D5100, D5200. You have ex extra cash to invest in lenses over over body. Right. Right, um, and then um, depending upon whether you're a sports photographer or you want to catch up uh, some some motion and rapid session, something may, may interest you is the uh, frames per second, which is they call it, they call it continuous drive. If you're lucky to get one frame per second out of uh, out of a point and shoot, um, this particular camera uh, will shoot three frames per second. The, the D800 will shoot four frames per second, and the D4S will shoot 11 frames per second. So that's, you know, if you're shooting somebody coming in to kick a goal in this, on, um, on soccer, and you hold down your um, the shutter release, you just hear the camera go as it cranks off 11 frames a second. And then you can go through and pick the picture that you think will be the best one for the newspaper. Yeah. Or really squirmy baby. A really squirmy you. baby, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think they could move 11 frames per second fast. Uh, full motion is 24 frames per second, which is probably either, either, either that or 30 frames per second. I'll ask my photographer over here. Is, is that 24 or 24. 30? 24. 24. 24. 24 frames per second. Okay. So that would be a full motion. We talked about that. We talked about that. The um, articulated LCD. That means it does this. Okay, you can take your, uh, your lens so you can look at it. If you want to shoot a selfie with your DSLR, you can do that. You can see what you're doing. Generally, I spin it around and I stick it in, in the back, which is exactly the way the, the fixed frame is. The, is Steve's comment articulated? Yep. <laughs> this comes off tape. Okay. The better cameras don't bother with it. Um, some of the disadvantages of the articulation is that obviously you can't make it as big as, as, as the other ones. And this is another thing you can buy externally, uh, a monitor that will connect to your camera. You can have a very big monitor that sits atop your professional camera, which oh, nice. a lot of videographers uh, use. That's good. Or you can just feed it into, uh, in, into the TV. Yeah, you're not quite as mobile if you're... Well, no, that. but one of the things I wanted to do and I couldn't, can't do is I tried to plug this guy in and it wouldn't do that. Um, if you, the, 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 the cables that you plug it in, because I wanted to use it as a, as a teaching point, where you could, um, you know, I could go through the menu here and you'd see the menu up on the screen. And uh, it doesn't do that. You connect it up, it's strictly for transferring images off of the computer or controlling the computer remotely with software from Nikon or Canon. So, um, but that sounds like uh, that would allow you to do it. Yep. Okay, good. So we'll have to remember that for the next time. Yeah, I'm sure there's some Wi Fi we can try to set up later. Okay. Um, and so let's see, I think that pretty much covers all the big things. And then for, I mean, something I do take into account because I have little tiny hands. Um, the weight and dimensions of the camera. So that's one of the reasons I actually, other than the price, that I picked this over another one of the full frame cameras is they do, they do weigh different amounts and you have to consider like a big lens and a camera body, how much do you want to be carrying around with you? Right. Which is another huge advantage Good to the point and shoot. This, is, this one is half a pound, okay? It's not very, very, very light. Um, this one is 1.2 pounds. And you get up to um, the, the D800 is 2.2 pounds, and the Nikon D4 is three pounds. So I don't know. Do you know what that one is? Probably closer to the D800. Okay. Very good. Um, and then dimensions, of course. They get as they get heavier, they also get larger. 
Okay, so we'll move on from that. All right, types of removable lenses. Okay, you have a white angle, and I, I've got a slide for it shows that anything less than 50 millimeters, 50 millimeters is is uh, basically what you see is what you get. And when, when you what you see when you look out with your eyes, that's either somewhere between 50 and 60 millimeters. 52 millimeter is the size of the lens on uh, my my film camera. I oh, know this is a 50 millimeter. Maybe this one's a 52. This is 18 to 55. This is zoom. That's right. Um, and then telephoto is anything greater than 60 millimeter. Is this this guy is a 75 to 300. Okay, and that's a zoom, so that allows yep. you to change it from start with 75 and work your way all the way out to 300. Yep. To 300. And then there's uh, also known as macro lenses. Macro lenses are good for people who want to take pictures of stamps or coins or um, bugs, little teeny tiny bugs, whatever it is, or integrated circuits. If you're into that. Um, and, uh, they allow you to get right up to it, um, and that's it. Uh, whereas this one, about as close as I could probably get, would be about that far. If I get any closer, it's gonna, I'll never be able to focus it. So a macro lens allows you to get very, very close. Okay, and I said earlier, lenses are matched to the sensor size. So you've got to watch. Um, you've got a, a very large optics, as in the, the Canon's lenses, and you can put that on. The, uh, the APS-C style cannon, and it'll, everything will look fine, but if you try to put it on the other one, it, it's, you're not going to be happy at all with the quality of the picture. So this gives us some examples. If you look in the upper left-hand corner there, that's a fisheye. It's a 180-degree view. Um, got these uh, prints off of uh, usa.canon.com. And this is an extreme wide angle. The person taking, taking this picture is able to see everything even outside of his peripheral vision. It's 180 degrees with this little thing he is here. It's, it's 180 degree view at 15 millimeters. They even have lenses that go to like nine millimeters. Which is thick, yeah. which is thick, let, they, let you see a little bit behind you. But they extremely, extremely distort. distort. You're, you're gonna see some, some major distortion on the edges of the side of your picture. Um, as you start to zoom in towards the telephoto range, um, you'll see an example of 20 millimeter. You're getting closer, 28 millimeters, 35. At this point, 50 millimeter. You see this little uh, light blue. I'm not sure if that's going to show up in the video, but you all should be able to see that. Uh, you're looking at a 46 degree field of view, and that's what you generally see uh, as you're looking out with your eyes. At this point, at 85 millimeter, you're narrowing down 28 degrees. You're getting closer. If you watch the steeple, it's hard to tell that it's a steeple, and the only reason I know it's a steeple because the next slide takes it all the way up to like 400 millimeters. Uh, you see the steeple starting to get closer in, in these pictures. And as we go a little bit further still, um, all the way up to 1200 millimeters, you're actually looking in at the top of the church in, in the picture. And that's a two degree, five minute uh, field of view at that particular point. So DSLR options. Uh, we talked a little bit about lens lens filters. My tip there: always keep a UV filter on to protect your lens. Um, remote controls. I have somewhere around here. This is a wireless remote control. Remote no, remote controls can be either uh, wired, like a, a shutter release. That's what I used to use for this, it was strictly mechanical. You screwed it into the shutter release and then you squeezed the little um, the little plunger and it, act, it mechanically pushed down and took a picture. These are uh, a, a lot nicer. I'll turn this guy on, go in my menu, and I go to release mode, and if you can see that. Um, release mode, and I'm gonna select a quick response remote. Okay. And then, I think I just ruined the picture. Anyway, <laughs> you get the effect. And so, and what's nice about this too is if you want to take a group photo, you simply you set everything up, put it on a tripod. Put it on a tripod, compose your picture, then go get in the picture yourself, push the button, and, uh, and away you go.
But is that how they do? Because it's fun. All right, so good to have. These are cheap too. Um, Ten, twelve dollars, all it costs. So no excuse not having one. Uh, camera case, yes, you definitely want to have a camera case, uh, something to organize, especially if you have multiple lenses. You have your, you have to keep your um, remote control in there, your charger for the battery that comes in your camera. Uh, essential part of it is a good case. Tripods, um, tripods are, are great for taking group photos. They're great for. Uh, if you have to shoot with a very, very slow shutter speed, Aaron will talk about techniques in, in a few minutes. With that, the tripod is essential if you're gonna shoot below a 30th of a second. Then you, if, the, if the tripod's too bulky, but you still need some support for your camera, you can get what's called a monopod, which I brought but didn't. I didn't uh, didn't bring up front, so we'll uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later after I, I turn it over to Aaron. And finally, uh, camera control software. If you want, you can you can hook up a laptop, um, connect up to the USB of your camera, and you can use uh, uh, special software to control the camera. That comes in handy, especially when you're shooting uh, when you're shooting with a macro lens, taking pictures of coins or um, or bugs or whatever it is that you like to take that's really small. So very helpful on that. And that's it for the equipment portion. Any questions? Yes? Do you have any recommendations on where you might go to purchase something like this? I mean, would you recommend online or going, is there a... As with any store? electronics, you can get them cheaper online, but you have to know what you want. Sure. If you don't know what you want, um, then your best bet is to go to a camera store. And uh, or you know, that can be a Best Buy or a Walmart, though I would stay away from Walmart simply because the, the, the staff's probably not anywhere near as knowledgeable as you would get at a camera store. You go to the camera store, if you go to a camera store, it's always recommended and they, to get, if you get them to give you their knowledge, you really should buy it from them uh, unless their price is exorbitantly more expensive than it is on the, on the um, uh, as it is on the internet. A lot of the electronic stores, and a lot of the camera stores are starting to disappear because people go to them, they get the information, and then they go buy it online. Yeah. And if people don't buy it, your, your camera stores and all your other places are, are, gonna, are gonna shut down because they can't afford to be online. So if you use their technical support to make your decision, buy it from them. And, uh, that, and they'll, the support will be there the next time when you wanna, uh, when you wanna use it. Other There's questions? a lot of really great reviews online. Uh, Amazon and B&H are places that I've gone to purchase equipment and read reviews. So I research tons of stuff before I buy anything. And in person, uh, this might be an unpopular opinion, but Craigslist has been very good to me for lenses. Because lenses keep their value and people tend to upgrade a lot. So as people are buying their fancy Canon L series lenses, they might be selling, you know, I got, I got this one, this 85, it's beautiful. Someone else just had outgrown it a little bit, so I was able to buy it this for discount. Okay, so let's get you started here. All right, so, now you guys have a lot of information about buying a camera. We're zoomed in here a little bit. Yeah, well, I think that's, 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 that's full frame. That's a TV. <laughs> the only thing I can do is, um, well, you, you, you're taking it all the way to the edge. I don't know if all your pictures do that. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's stretched too. Can okay. we just zoom out a little? Let's, let's undo the stretch. Okay. okay. <laughs> Look at that guy. Do you want to you want to run this in here? Uh, sure. Step out the picture so you can do it. So we're going to talk a little bit about what happens once you once you get the camera. So 
Almost everything I'm going to say will apply to a point and shoot, a DSLR, and even your smartphone, or any camera phone. But let's assume you have a point and shoot or an entry level DSLR, and you're trying to figure out what do I do next? How do I take photos? So the main things we're going to be talking about are subject, uh, the composition of the photo, and then shutter speed and aperture, which are a little bit of the, the technical aspects, but they're really easy to grasp once you, once you start playing with them. And then lastly, creativity in photographs. So the first thing is finding your subject. What am I taking a photo of? It's probably something you love, like this is Lily Meow Face, our cat, and she's a beautiful subject. Uh, so that can be portraits of family members, your pets, headshots of friends or uh, fashion events. Such weddings is a huge thing. That's that's a huge market for photographers. But if you're going to a wedding, there probably is a photographer. So maybe don't get go, don't get in their way. Uh, sports concerts is. Uh, as we go through this, you'll see a lot of rock photography because that's what I tend to do a lot. I love doing rock photography. I have a lot of fun with it. Um, and then sort of news, photojournalism is another event. Landscapes are very popular. I know Eileen over here loves taking pictures of sunsets. Um, nature shots, even cityscapes, and, and travel. When you travel, that's probably people's biggest reason to say, hey, maybe I should get a camera. I would like to, to get some good photos of my trip. And then lastly, Cliff mentioned a lot of macro photography is for stills. This can be flowers, uh, product shots for your website. Uh, coins is something Cliff enjoys doing. Food is a huge thing. A lot of cooking websites, you want great shots of your food so people want to try your recipes. Art and uh, tutorials. If you're trying to teach someone how to do a trade and you want to post a blog post about it, getting really good shots of whatever it is you're making is super helpful. So once you decide what's your subject, next we have to talk about how to compose your shot. So the main five things that you should be thinking about, and this can just sort of be in the back of your mind, you can be very actively thinking about these five things, are the focal point of the photo, foreground and background, where the light source is, and the balance of the shot. So we're going to go quickly through each of these. So the focal point in a photo is where is your eye drawn first? What is it that you're trying to get the viewer to look at. In this shot, it's the head of the guitar, which you can see is sort of cent centered but off to the left, but it's the part that's in focus. So immediately, everyone here was drawn there first and then back into the photo. So if you if you have a, a flower that you're trying to, to get, maybe the flower is in focus and the leaves behind it are not as in focus, or maybe whatever the focal point is is more lit than everything else but it should have some kind of contrast to make your eye drawn to whatever the focal point is. Next, thinking about what's the foreground of your photo, it's usually the subject. So just making, figuring out where's the subject and making sure that wherever it is in the photograph is up front, hopefully in focus, and something just goes back to the focal point. You want your foreground to appear well lit and well framed within the shot. So most people already know this naturally, and they, they have their, their foreground and their subject well framed, but they don't always consider the background of the photo. In this case, you know, I got these guys at a rock show, and I thought they looked really cool, but you don't want to forget what's happening behind that. I tried to get the, uh, the guitar player or bass player here in between the two guys so it, it shows the context of the photo. So you can tell that we're in an underground show here because you can see someone playing in the background. If you're taking a portrait of maybe your granddaughter or, or friends, trying to, if it's really messy behind them, you can either clean up really fast or hey, say, hey, move over a few feet, let's get the, the prettier part of the wall. So just don't forget that the background will show up in your photo and try to pay attention to it. Um, light source is very important. This could be 
overhead lighting, which you don't have to think about quite as much. But if we're in a, this was a really dark room, and the only light source was this lamp. So I had to say, all right, I need to be in a place so the light is shining right on the side of this guy's face so you can actually see his face. If I moved over a little bit, the light was behind him and his face was super dark. This comes into play a lot when you're outside and it's a really sunny day and you want to take a great shot and all of a sudden the sun's shining at you and the subjects are backlit and you can't see their faces. And that's probably what you were trying to shoot. You want to see someone smiling. So what you would do is just move a little bit so when you take the picture, the light's shining at the side of them or at the front of them and not from right behind. And finally, balance is a trickier, more abstract thing to think about. But in general, a photo is really nice when it has some sort of balance. And this could either be two equal things side by side or some kind of asymmetrical balance. Right here, Ryan's drum kit takes up more space and he's a little more lit, but Steven is on the other side. So the picture is balanced, but not equal. And this is really something that it's, it sort of just takes your eye and something that the more pictures you, you take, the more you understand how to create balance. And this is the fun stuff. So all of these you don't have to stress about too much, just something to keep in mind. And the more you take photos, the more practice you'll have in achieving all of these composition elements. So next, we're going to talk a bit about the technical aspects which is referred to as the exposure triangle. And when you're in automatic mode, which every single camera has, it will take into account all three of these principles. The ISO is equivalent to the old actual film had different ISOs, and Cliff can tell you what ISO stands for, and I've long since forgotten because Really all it does is allow you to take into account different lights. If you have a really dark room, you want to shoot your ISO up pretty high or maybe as high as it can go, you know, 4,000, 6,000. When you get up too high, it gets grainy. And if it's a really well lit room, you can get it down to 100, 400, something like that, which is what normal film would be. For the sake of this, I don't adjust my ISO very much, and when you're starting out, it's something not to worry about. It'll have an automatic setting that the camera's smart enough to figure out what, what you need. For this presentation, we're just going to be talking about aperture and shutter speed, which are the two other aspects, because uh, these are a little bit more fun and let you do more creatively. So, when we start with shutter speed, during the shutter speed is how long the, uh, the shutter is open. So it, however, the aperture is how wide it is, which we'll talk about in a second. But whatever your aperture is set to, your lens lets in an amount of light, and the shutter speed says, how long am I allowing the light in for? And these tend to be, at the very high end, a few seconds, unless you're doing some crazy star trails, in which you can leave it open for, you know, a full, six hours or something like that, but most times it's a fraction of a second. If I was going to take a picture of you guys right here, it would be maybe one one hundredth of a second. So very slow shutter speeds allow blurring of uh, moving objects, like you'll see cars blur their headlights, that might be open for a full second. And very fast shutter speeds, which is what you'll be using more often, allow you to capture a moment. Someone flipping their hair. It'll capture that moment in a fraction of a second. So, shutter speed describes how long the lens should stay open. I probably should have put the slide first. Um, just remember that the 1 over 60 means a 60th. So then 1 over 100, even though it's a bigger, you know, the denominator is a bigger number, it means it's faster. And 1,000 1, will let you get that, that sports shot, someone crossing the finish line. So here's just a, a photo. Again, I, I have a lot of rock photos. So this was a, an example of a slow shutter speed. Ryan's moving really fast when he's drumming. 
and you can actually see his drumstick blurred in motion because it was a 30th of a second or something like that. So the way you might use this is you can use uh, shutter speed priority on your camera and actually change it. And this is a really fun thing to just explore on your own when you um, take the same photo, take it one second. And anything above a 30th or a 50th of a second, we'll use the tripod. So for a tri set, set up a tripod and say, what will happen if I hold the shutter speed for two seconds, then one second, then half a second, and, and make the time shorter and shorter and see how they all compare. It's sort of get the hang of it. And then aperture is something that I really like playing with. This is probably my, my favorite piece of the exposure triangle. And the aperture can either be, we talk about it in narrow apertures or wider apertures. I'll flip ahead for a second. Um, the aperture setting is how wide the lens is at the moment. We've got these mechanisms that allow a lot of light, a really wide aperture and a very, very narrow aperture. And these are expressed in the f-stop, so f1.4 would be a very wide aperture, and then f16 or 22 is very narrow. And you can kind of think of it as like your eye. So we'll go back here for a second. So the narrow aperture, like f16, 22, is very narrow and what it does is it makes the picture very focused so everything that you're taking will be just as clear the foreground the background midground everything's crystal clear which if that's what you're going for a lot of times you really want to perfectly capture the, the environment it's really nice to have that narrow aperture and you get to worry less sometimes it's hard to focus so the more narrow the aperture is you don't have to worry about your picture being out of focus and a wide aperture will allow a lot of light in, it, so the lens will be, the aperture will be open for less time, it'll have a smaller shutter speed. And this gives you this depth of field effect, um, which you can see over here. It allows you to put one part of the picture in focus and have everything else out of focus. And DSLRs create a really beautiful effect when something's out of focus in the background. It's very soft and very artistic. So this is a very fun way to get those gorgeous shots and it brings your eye. I'm taking a picture, not of the band here, but of the lady drawing the band. And by having a very shallow depth of field, I'm able to, to, to show that. So this is a cat who was at that very dimly lit show before and all I wanted was the cat's face in focus and the rest of its body, even though the cat's not very big, by having a very shallow depth of field, it creates an artistic effect where his, uh, her tail is, is blurred and it sort of looks like a glamour shot of the cat. This is a shallow depth of field. And again, aperture is something that you can have full manual mode and set them both and use the light meter or just set it to aperture priority and if you change it to 1.4 and then you go up and go all the way to 16 the camera will figure out all those pieces and adjust the shutter speed and the ISO to, to account for the light so you don't have to f do all of that in your head and you don't have to figure it out and that's what I suggest is I'll talk about this a little bit later, but pick one thing at a time to really understand. And then once you get the hang of it, then you can adjust the ISO and the shutter speed and the aperture to your liking. But there's no, you know, take, pick one at a time. So now we're going to talk a little bit about creativity and sort of taking creative chances with your photos. We're in DSLR now. You can take thousands of photos. So, you know, let's we can play a little bit. And the first thing I think it's fun to play with when you're taking photos is changing your perspective. We don't have to have every photo as if I'm standing there and looking at something like, there was this dog at the show and it was super cute. So I got on the ground and took a picture of the dog like standing in front of his mom who's playing the cello there. And you know, you might look silly on the ground taking photos, but you'll get really cute pictures of dogs and other, other things like that. And you'll see photographers holding the camera up really high or sideways and 
It doesn't always have to be eye level. Next, uh, try to connect with a moment. You're there, you probably love whatever you're taking photos of. This was a, sort of an intimate acoustic show with a couple of our friends and they're just, they're so beautiful the way that they, they look at each other and they're, they're so in sync that I tried to capture that moment where they were just looking at each other like, all right, we're gonna play the next chord together. Um, try to find contrast. Uh, this can be a little silly. This is uh, Steven being a goofball and our friend Lisa, and she's sort of like, what am I, what am I doing? So like finding contrast in not only the light of a picture, but what are the people's expressions. Uh, if there's like a lot of color on one half, and then there's this like person who's really dressed all gray, like what kind of contrast? Always be on the lookout for something, because it'll probably be a lot of, it'll make your picture fun. Um, and last, look for movement. This could be, in this picture, there's so much movement. This band like, plays in a circle, and all their instruments are sort of pointed in this circle. And then the shadows of this basement are sort of pointed around. So like, there's this spiral thing going on. And movement can be sort of like that, with shadows and just lines. Or it could be actual movement. Someone, someone's running, someone's moving. Uh, because photography is capturing a moment, capturing movement, uh, it has a really nice effect when you look for it and try to grab that moment. And then always stay playful. Photography is a lot of fun. It's goofy. Um, people do crazy things and you can sort of get that playfulness into your, into your frame. And you should be having fun, otherwise your pictures aren't going to be fun. So lastly, um, it's super overwhelming. All there's so much gear and there's so many things to think about that start with automatic everything when you first get your camera. Just don't worry about all that stuff. Put it sort of back of your mind and put full of automatic and just take shots and get comfortable with your gear. Like I said, then one by one tackle the manual settings. Maybe the first thing you want to tackle is focusing. Put it on automatic mode, automatic focus, and then when you feel comfortable taking photos, switch it off and then try manually focusing. And once you get the hang of that, maybe put it back on manual mode, or automatic mode, and then play with the shutter speed. And then play with the aperture. And don't overwhelm yourself. One thing at a time, and it will come naturally. And the last thing is always shoot more than you need. Like we talked about the frames per second. I put it, especially for rock shows or whatever, I put it on burst mode and I'll have way more photos than I know what to do with at the end and you edit it down. And for those type of shows, I use maybe five to 10% of the photos that I took are the good ones. And that's fine, they're digital. You can store them if you want, store just cheap or just dump the ones that you hate. There's, there's no reason to be uh, economic with your shooting. And lastly, I have just a few sort of words of advice as you're starting out on your photographic journey, is capture what you love. If it's your family, if it's music, if it's flowers, sunsets, any of the above, try to, like, what would you like memories of? So always capture what you love. And let go of judgment. And this is self-judgment, don't think. Oh, I'm a bad photographer. I hate this shot. It's too dark. These turned out awful. That's, everyone, you gotta screw up a lot. And so just let yourself, and don't, don't judge yourself if your photos aren't perfect. They'll get there. Don't stress over the mechanics. This goes back to, you know, one thing at a time, or stress over the, the gear too much. Like, you can take beautiful pho uh, pictures with a phone, so don't worry too much about all the other stuff when you're just getting out there and taking photos. And to keep motivated, I find that it's helpful to share those pictures. Don't hoard them all. Share them on your Facebook page, make a Flickr account, uh, send them to your family. Just keep sharing things because people probably want to see them and they'll be thrilled that you're sharing your photos with them and then you'll in turn get really excited and want to go out and take more photos. So it's a really good way to keep, keep at it and just have a lot of fun. Photography is fun 